He is the longest serving state house leader in the nation, but with a disappointing election day now in the rearview mirror and questions about the ComEd bribery scandal hanging overhead, could this be the end of the road for House Speaker Mike Madigan? WGN political reporter Tamon Bradley has more on the Democrats speaking out against the powerful House Speaker. Michael J. Madigan. For four decades, Michael J. Madigan has ruled Democratic politics in Illinois with an iron fist. Politicians challenged his authority at their own peril. But this November, months before a new legislature is sworn in, there are giant cracks in Madigan's armor. This is truly kind of the, the, the most serious jeopardy that I think we've seen in the history of Madigan's uh, leadership in Illinois among Democrats. Eight Democrats publicly say they won't vote for Madigan as House Speaker, and political heavyweights say it's time for him to step down as party chairman. Last weekend, Bob Morgan of Highwood emailed his constituents. The allegations surrounding Speaker Madigan and Commonwealth Edison are extremely troubling, as are ones about sexual harassment by top aides. More and more Democrats share this sentiment. The fact of Madigan really being kind of like a, an anchor around their necks and that every response becomes, what are you going to do about Madigan? What are you going to do about Madigan? These rank and file lawmakers are getting tired of answering that question. Perhaps the biggest blow to Madigan came when U.S. Senator Dick Durbin, a force in national politics, said Democrats paid a heavy price at the polls for Madigan's leadership. He was referring to the defeat of the graduated income tax amendment and losses in House districts Democrats expected to win. Senator Tammy Duckworth echoed Durbin's concerns. And then Governor Pritzker, who for months hedged on Madigan, called on the 78-year-old to hand off his chairmanship. To be clear, you agree with Senator Durbin that we need new leadership at the party? Yes. Republicans are piling on. What more will it take for these House Democrats to publicly come out and say that they will not support Speaker Madigan? Mike Madigan has overseen corruption on a scale that none of us thought possible. Um, and that corruption has hurt us all. To keep the Speaker's gavel, Madigan needs 60 votes. Democrats likely hold 72 House seats, so Madigan can only afford a couple more defections. Supporters are pushing back. I'm predicting that Speaker Madigan is going to get 68 votes. When Bruce Rauner in 2015 tried to decimate Illinois social service programs, it was Speaker Madigan who stood up to all Democrats and said, that we are in a fight for the heart and soul of the Democratic Party in Illinois. With the Springfield veto session canceled for now, Madigan now has more time to sort out issues with his caucus. Paul? Hey, thanks, Tamon. Patrick Martin directs government policy and public affairs practice here in Illinois and across the Midwest for Cozen O'Connor Public Strategies. He joins me this morning via Zoom. Patrick, good to see you. Thanks for joining me. Great to be with you, Paul. So, I mean, for the first time ever, you've got calls for Madigan to step down from both senators, Durbin and Duckworth, from J.B. Pritzker. Pretty incredible. And yet, he gets backing of labor unions stepping in. So, I just want to take your pulse right now. With all this up and down, where exactly do Speaker Madigan's powers check in at this point? Yeah, well, it's a great question, and this is certainly the toughest battle of Speaker Madigan's career. You saw Governor Pritzker and both U.S. Senators from Illinois uh, call for him to step down as head of the Democratic Party in Illinois, and you are seeing an increasing number of his own members uh, call for him uh, to step down. He continues to have strong su support in the Black Caucus and from organized labor, and it's an open question as to how this is all going to play out, but this is certainly uh, as much pressure, political pressure, as he's felt in a long time. So the House Minority Leader, uh, Durkin, Jim Durkin, said, you know, look, we were supposed to, we Republicans, we're supposed to lose 11 seats in the State House. We've got a gain of two, maybe more before this is all done. And we've been outspent, Durkin says, five to one by Madigan. So I'm sort of curious, what is your take on, since you look at all of this and study this, the impact, or maybe the better word is fallout, for how advancing legislation will happen in, in a new term, uh, the negotiations of COVID and budgets, and how does that happen? Well, you saw uh, just this week there was an announcement that the veto section was going to be canceled. Uh, and so everyone is looking to next year uh, and what the new political dynamic will bring uh, in Springfield following the election that we all just saw uh, took place. Uh, really, what I think you're seeing is a combination of different factors all come into play. Uh, you had the fair tax uh, vote fail. Um, you have Congress uh, and the White House not coming together at all on a stimulus package. Uh, and it doesn't look like it'll happen this year. 
And you also have uh, a situation where the political dynamics appear to be changing within the caucus, and Speaker Madigan is going to have uh, a smaller Democratic caucus than he had before. All of these things are coming together uh, to create a very challenging legislative environment next year in the middle of a global pandemic. So you mentioned the graduated income tax. I want to talk specifically about that. But first, I guess what I want to ask is, so do Republicans get a stronger voice in a new term because of all that you've, you've just talked about? Or the numbers are still the numbers. Democrats still control with an iron fist. Yeah, the Democrats still have tremendous majorities uh, in both houses, and, and so it's going to make it, it challenging for Republicans. But you saw some cracks. Uh, you certainly saw the elections go a little differently than a lot of people anticipated. And so I think members of the Democratic Party are going to be making sure that their messaging is consistent with what they thought that they heard from their constituents uh, from the election. Uh, let's talk about the graduated income tax for a moment. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure you have, and I just hear from so many people as they try and get a handle on that. This was the first major setback for Governor Pritzker, I mean, major for him. But the way you look at it and study it, is this a Pritzker setback, or was this really a fear among Illinoisans basically saying, look, the idea of a, of a progressive tax is a good one, but we don't trust Springfield to not start raising taxes on every one of those categories of, of incomes that would have been set up, because in fact, they would argue it makes it easier for them to do that. Well, it was certainly a setback for the governor. This was his number one uh, priority, and obviously the people have spoken and have made a decision on how they viewed uh, the fair tax. Um, but going forward, this is just one of a number of different problems that uh, leaders in Illinois are going to be facing. Uh, the fair tax was uh, expected to raise significant revenue, uh, and as we're looking at the budget shortfall in Illinois from uh, pension liability uh, and also given everything that's happened with COVID-19, we are entering a period of fiscal austerity in the state of Illinois. And I think it's gonna be a lot of gloom and doom uh, from the governor's budget address next year. I anticipate a lot of really difficult decisions and you're already starting to see that uh, with the governor and his team and what they're putting out. Well, you couldn't have set up my next question any better because here you are saying we've sort of never seen a situation like this in terms of the, the state of the state and where we are. And so I would have said, well, then it's a good thing they'll tackle this in the upcoming veto session, except what happens? No veto session, canceled because of COVID concerns. How does legislation, be it budget, as you're talking about, be it COVID, how does it proceed? Does more power simply go in the hands of the leaders as they attempt to handle things without consultation with the legislation, legislature? Well, you're exactly right. You're hearing uh, some rumblings from the rank and file that it is a lot harder for them to have a say uh, when veto session is getting canceled. And there's definitely members that are concerned that this is going to create a vacuum and leadership is going to be making all the decisions. I think the bigger issues at play are the real big issues people are hearing about from their constituents. And as we're looking at possibly huge cuts across the board in the state of Illinois, I think what members are most fearful of is the hard decisions that are going to have to be made next year to address all of the issues facing Illinois. And, and I think that all members uh, and the governor are really anticipating this is going to be a really difficult period ahead as we enter next year with no relief in sight from the federal government uh, anytime soon. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if Illinois sort of enters a moment of change one way or another. We're going to see Patrick Martin of Cozen O'Connor. Thanks for being with me. I appreciate your insights. Thanks so much for having me. All right, we're going to take one more break and we're coming right back.